You know, Dorinda Clark Cole got a song called I've Got a Reason. And she outlines all of these reasons why she has to praise the Lord. She said, there are so many things that God has brought me through. If I had all night, it wouldn't be enough time to tell you. She said, I've got a reason. I really do got a reason. She said that she could have been dead sleeping in her grave. Yes, I got a reason. She said he has allowed me one more day, so I got a reason. She said, many years have come and gone, but it's amazing that God has kept us through every one of them. And today, right now, she said, where I stand, I've got a testimony. I've got a testimony. I've got a reason. She said, because he woke me up early this morning, she started pointing him out. That's a reason. And started me on my way. Yeah. That's a reason. She said, he opened my mouth and I can talk. That's a reason. She said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. That's a reason. She said, God saved me, put his arms around me, and forgave me. That's a reason. Yeah. The song got so good, she said, woo, I really got a reason. She couldn't even say nothing else. She said, trouble all around me. But you protected me. That's the reason. She said, when I look back over my life and see how he brought me through, that's the reason. She said she got a reason. She said he put food on her table, clothes on her back, and she got a reason. She said he put shelter over my head. He's done just what he said. Yeah, close. Now, she said when she was despondent and nobody was around, when she was low, when she had loss of spirit, when she looked back at the times when she almost left, lost her life, she said that was a reason to praise God. Now, if any one of those things, and all of them should apply to everybody up in here, we need to give God some praise. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. Hey. Thank you, Lord. I oh, worship God. you, God. Hey, 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 hey. I glorify hey, your hey, name, hey, God. Hey, There's nobody like you, Lord God. Hey, I got a reason, Lord God. Yes. You are so good, Lord. Thank you, thank so you. kind, Lord. So loving, Lord God. Lord God, we can do nothing without you, Lord God. It's in you that we live, we move, yeah. we have our being, Lord God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't breathe without you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Lord God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, Lord God, your keeping power, Lord God. I thank you for your love, your long suffering, oh God, towards us, Lord God. You didn't give us what we deserve, and I thank you, Lord God. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you and only you would be glorified today, yes, Lord God. Yes, yes. I pray, Lord God, that you would have your way in this place, Lord God, on today, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that your word would go forth with power and with authority, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Have your way, Lord God. I'm sitting down, you standing up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. In the name of Jesus, have your way and be glorified. Whew, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. It's really good to be here. It's really good to be here. I miss y'all. Oh my God, y'all don't even know. I watch the service. I miss him more than words could say. But I still keep in contact and I talk to him. But I'm so glad to be here. And this is, this is home, y'all. This is home. I spent 21 years here. And I learned a whole lot. And I'm grateful for that. I thank God for my wife. Y'all know God gave me a good wife. He gave me a good hey! wife. Gee. 
that really walked by my side and helped me. And she fine. She fine, y'all. And she fine. But Bishop, thank you for allowing me to come. First Lady, thank y'all for everything y'all have ever done for me. I truly appreciate it. Um, the title of my message today is called Hope Against Hope. Hope against hope. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Our scripture is Romans 4.18, if y'all don't mind standing for the word. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version, this one. It reads, in hope against hope. Abraham believed that he would become a father of many nations as he had been promised by God. And I'm stopping right there on that one. So today we're going to be talking about the life of Abraham and how he used hope against hope because he really used hope against hope. But to really get a better understanding of Abraham, we need to look at his life. Y'all can be seated and how he was able to have this type of relationship with God that he had because he had an awesome relationship with God. So I'm going to walk you through Abraham's life to make a point. So let's start with the, the life of Abram. Now, first, he was Abram before God changed his name. All right? So in Genesis chapter 12, in the King James Version, in 1 through 5, God calls Abraham. And the word reads, now the Lord had said unto Abraham, get, out of, get thee out of thy country mm -hmm. and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse thee them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance, substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So, Abraham, Abram, is told to get out of his country, to leave his relatives, to leave his father's house. God told him to go to a land that he would show him, and that he would make his name great and make him a blessing. He told him that he would bless those who bless him and curse those who cursed him. God also told him that he would be a blessing. So pretty much, God was saying, listen to me and do what I'm telling you and everything is going to work out all right. So Abraham did exactly what God told him to do. He left, but not only did he leave, y'all, he had no clue where he was going. No clue. And he came from a heathen family. His family worshipped other gods. But he left not knowing where he was going. Can somebody say hope against hope? Hope against hope. So he also took Sarai and Lot and everything they owned. And he was 75 years old when God called him. So for somebody, you are not too old for God to use you. He called him when he was 75. So in chapter 12, Abraham foresees a little trouble here, a little situation. So he tells his wife, he say, now, baby, you know you, you, you're really fine. You really look, look good. You're really good on the eyes. And so when these Egyptians see you, I need you to say that you my sister. Because they're going to kill me and they're going to take you. So I need you to do this everywhere we go so that my life will be spared. The good thing about it, Abraham wasn't lying. Because that was his half-sister. All right? They had the same father but different mothers. So Pharaoh, his guys, 
went and told them, amen. It's a lady on the lot, and she, oh, my God, she looks really, really good. And so Pharaoh, he had the nerve. He, he took her. But God sent plagues to Pharaoh in Pharaoh's house, and he let her go. But they didn't leave empty-handed. God allowed them to get a whole bunch of stuff. Now, this is the first of two times that he had to say that this was his sister. The second time was when King Abimelech took her as well, but God told him in a dream that he was a dead man and sent some stuff to him too. And so he gave her up. But in both situations, God used them to bless Abram and Sarai because they were living right and obeying God. So for one, this is a little sidebar here. We can't expect God to do all of this stuff for us that we want him to do and bless us if we are here living any old kind of way. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. It just does not work like that. It just doesn't work like that. But that's how we want it sometimes. We want to do what we want to do and live how we want to live and not pay no God no attention and all of that and still want God to bless us. But see, Abraham was walking up right before God so he could expect for God to bless him. So he was following God, being obedient to God. He submitted his life as a life of worship to God. So remember, God told Abraham that he would bless those who blessed him and curse those who cursed him. Abraham didn't have to do anything at all but be obedient to God. Another little sidebar. Sometimes when people do stuff to us, we think we got to take matters in our own hands and get them back and, you know, give them evil as well. But we don't have to do anything, but we can live on this same principle right here in the Bible. Amen. We can walk with God and he'll bless those who bless us and curse those who curse us the same way. We don't have to do anything. All we need to do is obey God and he'll do the rest. And always please remember when you're in a situation like Abraham ended in right here, what seems like it may be a bad situation, God could be using the very situation that somebody in this room is in, amen, to bless them. He could use that situation to bless you. But we got to trust him. We got to believe like this man believed. All right? So I'm keep walking y'all through these chapters. So in Genesis 13, Abram and Sarah and Lot, and everybody that they had, they left Egypt. Now, they're pretty wealthy at this point, both of them. But the land they were living in couldn't hold both of them. So they had some strife between Abraham herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. And Abraham was like, hey, we relatives. We can't have this going on. All right. So Abraham told him, you know, we're living too close together. We got all this out here. Pick which side you want. If you go to the left, i go to the right. If you go to the right, i go to the left. So they separated, which was key. They separated. Lot picked one side, but Lot picked the side that looked good to his eyes, that was well watered, looked like it was going to produce all of this stuff. He did all of that. But Abraham went with hope and believed God. That's what he did. Can y'all say hope against hope again? So they separated. And when they separated, God told Abraham some things. Sometimes we need to separate from some people in our lives so that God can tell us some things. So we need to remove ourselves from some people. If they're not adding to us, but they're taking away from us, we need to get away from them. We need to separate ourselves, oh my God, from the world because we are in the world, but we not of the world. So everything that's going on in the world, all of this drama, all of this crazy stuff, it does not apply to us because we're under some whole different principles. So we need to separate ourselves from the world, the things of the world. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It just don't work like that. So we need to separate ourselves. And then, Bishop, can I use your talk to the lights? I'm going to talk to the lights and say, 
Some people might need to separate themselves from people in their own house that ain't supposed to be there. So if you're living with somebody that you shouldn't be living with, you need to separate yourself and get them on out of there. If you're in a relationship that's ungodly, that's not lined up with the principles of God, then you need to get out of that relationship. You need to separate yourself so God can your and to you because he always got something to say. But he ain't going to just talk to us and we live in any old kind of way. It just don't work like that. And right now, we don't need to be taking no chances out here in this world because we know that God gives the devil permission to do anything that he does. But the devil seemed like he got a little bit more permission right now. And if you're out of God's will, the devil is trying to take you all the way over and get rid of you. So we don't need to be playing on the devil's little territory. We don't need to. So after they separated, God talked to him and told him that all the land that he sees was his forever and that his seed was going to be blessed and it was going to be as the dust of the earth. So many that he couldn't even count. Abraham ended up having a little worship service out there. He learned how to worship God with his life and worship God in all situations. But y'all know when we worship and walking before Lord, the Lord, Y'all know who coming, right? Little Slewfoot coming, right? He coming. Huh? So in chapter 14, God tells Abram that his reward was going to be great for his obedience. But then Lot, he going to take his crazy self down here and get kidnapped. So he go and get kidnapped because he looking at the wrong thing from Jump Street in the first, first place. He going to get kidnapped. But Abraham take 318 men and go down there and rescue him. And so when this happened, when he rescued him, the king of, of Sodom tried to give Abraham all this stuff after his victory. But see, Abram, he got this relationship with God where he believed God, and he know that he only wants stuff from God because God says he make us rich and add no sorrow with it. So when this situation happened, he told him, man, I don't want nothing from you. He was like, because if I take this from you, then you're going to think that you made Abraham rich. But I want God, oh my God, to get the glory out of everything that he does. I don't want it to look like I had nothing to do with it because I want to give God this testimony. I want to give this testimony and I want to be able to give God this glory that he did everything that happened for me. So that's how he was with his relationship with God. So, in this situation in chapter 15, we're going to chapter 15 now. I'm getting to a point, believe me. God tells Abram that his reward would be great for his obedience. Abram tells God, but man, God, I don't have a son. This is a relationship right here where he can talk to God like this? Where he can talk to him like this and tell him, God, I don't have a son. And the Lord responded by pretty much telling him that he would have a son of his own and to go out and look at the stars and see if he could count them. This is how many descendants he would have. So in Genesis 15 and 6, it says that Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And so in 418, that's what Paul is referring to right here. So remember now, I need y'all to remember something. Abraham, Abram is 75 years old right now. And God tells him that he is going to have a son and he believes God at 75 years old. He believed God. Somebody say hope against hope. Because it still ain't no son. So while Abram is using hope against hope, here come the devil right here, Bishop in chapter 16. So Sarai come with this idea, she like, Abram, why don't you take Hagar and sleep with her and get her pregnant because that might be how God want to give us some children. So Abram was like, well, that don't sound too bad. And so, and so he, he like, hey, it don't sound too bad. So he went with it. Now the thing was, she hadn't given him, given him any children, as we know. And the Bible says that in chapter 11 that she was, in fact, 
she was barren. So they went with it. He slept with her. She became pregnant. But then she started looking at Sarai a little funny, rubbing her tummy at her, making her feel some kind of way. And we know eventually she got sent on her way with a little sandwich and some water. Because Sarai, she just, she just couldn't take it no more. Now, Abraham, please catch all of this. He was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. This is 11 years late after God told him he was going to have a son. He's 86, 75 when he first told him, he's 86. So God told him, you know, about these descendants, all of this stuff, but it's 11 years later, it still ain't happened. Somebody say hope against hope. That's our little catchphrase for today. So in chapter 17, 13 years later, he's 99 years old, 99 years old, still holding on to God's promise, still believing God, still trusting God. God comes and tells him again that he was going to give him countless descendants. He went a little further this time. He changed his name to Abraham, changed Sarai's name to Sarah. He told him that he would have his own son by Sarah and that his name was going to be Isaac and that he was going to be born about this time next year. God guaranteed everything that he promised Abraham would happen if he served God faithfully and lived a blameless life. That was the key. But still, it's no son of promise yet by Sarah. Can y'all say hope against hope one more time? Hope against hope. So in chapter 18, Abraham gets this visit from the Lord. So these three men come on the scene. And so they come on the scene, and Abraham runs to them, bows down. When God was on the scene, Abraham knew exactly what to do. He knew how to honor God when God was on the scene. That's what we need to do, too. When God is on the scene, we need to honor him. We need to worship him when he's on the scene. Abraham did that. He bowed and went out to meet him. So this is all because of this relationship that he had with God. Don't y'all know this is all about a relationship? It ain't about religious duties and religion and all of that stuff. Forget all of that. It's about relationship. God is a God of relationship. You can't be in a relationship with nobody and the relationship ain't on point. It ain't going to work. So God is a God of relationship. It's about relationship. See, our relationship is the key, and nothing should change that. Abraham didn't change his relationship with God when times were good or when times was bad. That ain't how a good relationship works. You stay in there with that relationship if it's going good or going bad. All right? So he knew and understood that regardless of what was going on, God was still God. And we got to remember that God is still God, regardless of the situation. Amen. Glory to God. We have to remember that. So God tells Abraham yet again, Sarah will have a baby by this time next year. Now, he's 99 years old and she's 89 years old. And God telling them they're going to have a baby. Now, to the natural man, the natural mind, that just don't add up. But if we look at 18, Genesis 18, 9 through 14, in the New Living Translation, nine through fourteen. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. So they, where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent. Abraham replied. Then one of them said, "I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son." Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah both were very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? Especially when my master, my husband, is also old. She threw Abraham under the bus. <laughs> then the Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh? Why does she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is there anything too hard for the Lord. I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. 
So when the Lord announced this to Abram, by this time next year, Sarah would give birth to a son. We know she laughed. She was overheard laughing in unbelief, right? The news was so astonishing to this 99-year-old Sarah that she doubted God's word and his promise. But God is God, right? Oh, my God, he's amazing. He's so awesome. God countered Sarah's question, can an old woman like me have a baby with one of his own? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Because he God. God answered Sarah's unbelief with his assurance. Nothing is too hard for me. When Sarah doubted the Lord, she was questioning in both his truthfulness and his ability. Sarah's like us sometimes. We do that sometimes, right? We do that sometimes. Sometimes we doubt that God will keep his promise because it's taking too long. Oh, my God. Because it ain't manifesting right after we got it. But we got to wait on it. That don't change nothing. He probably trying to get us to a place where we can handle it in the first place. Because if he give it to us right then, we going to mess it up and make him look bad. We shouldn't want to make God look bad. It should be some stuff that we just ain't going to do because we love God just that much. Like it's some stuff I just ain't going to do because I love my wife just that much. I don't care about anything else in regards to that. I just ain't going to do it because I love her that much. Same with God. There's some stuff I just ain't going to do. If I got to stand by myself, there's some stuff that I'm just not going to do when it comes to being on the wrong side of the Lord. Because people are dying out here in their sins. And I don't want to be the one that mess up. So I got to stay in God's face. So you know what? I keep my family with me all the time. Janiah is my security guard. I can't go nowhere without her. And I welcome her going everywhere that she needs to go because she's my security guard. So we need to believe God, though. And God is asking us this same question. He's asking us this question, y'all. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So I'm asking y'all, we y'all hope against hope? So sure enough, in chapter 21, I'm almost at my point. In chapter 21... A baby is born named Isaac. Sarah's 90 years old and Abraham is 100. So now, please, please pay close attention to Romans 4, 18 through 21. We're going to read the Amplified. It's going to be on the screen. I'm going to read the message because they don't have that translation. And then we're going to read the New Living Translation. So we're going to start with the Amplified. Romans chapter 4. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. God is amazing. It's really nothing that God can't do. We just got to wrap our mind around it and believe it and receive it. In hope against hope, Abraham believed that he would become a father of many nations. Oh, my God. As he had been promised by God, so numberless shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body now as good as dead for producing children since he was about 100 years old. And he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he did not doubt or waver in unbelief concerning the promise of God. Nothing could shake that. Being fully convinced that God had the power to do what he promised. Oh, my God. And this message version, this message version, oh, my God, hallelujah. We call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many peoples. God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life with a word. Make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, 
Abraham believed anyway, decided not to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but what on God said he could do. And so he was made father of a multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, you are going to have a big family, Abraham. That's what God told him. And then the last one, the New Living Translation. 18 through 21. This is good here. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Even when there was no reason to hope. No reason to hope. No reason to hope. When there was no reason to hope. Oh, my God. No reason. No reason at all. Abraham kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger and in this, he brought glory to God. He was faithfully, he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promised. So Abraham, his hope was not concerned by the fact that he was 100 years old. He was not weak in his hope or his faith, y'all. Abraham, y'all know what he did? Y'all don't know what he did? Do y'all really want to know what he did? Abraham put his natural hope up against spiritual hope. He put his natural hope that really ain't going to do a whole lot in this situation because sperm cells and eggs and all of that stuff, they owe who knows how they could get around all of this stuff. That natural hope, it was nothing there. He put his natural hope up against spiritual hope. See, he had this relationship with God that was amazing. This relationship was what allowed him to put his spiritual hope up against natural hope so that his spiritual hope could prevail. Even when there was no reason to hope, he kept hoping. That's what we got to do. Regardless of what it looked like, we got to keep hoping. We got to keep hoping. When the odds are against us, oh my God, thank you, Jesus, we have to keep hoping. When the doctors say, well, you got to keep hoping. You got to keep hoping. Where's your spiritual hope? We need to walk in the spirit so we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we put more in our spirit, man, then our flesh, man, got to sit down and God can do what he want to do. But we're around here thinking about stuff and thinking too much and listening to what somebody say and what this person say and what they saying on the TV. And we need to use spiritual hope. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. He never wavered. That means he was never shook. It was never a chance when he didn't think that it couldn't happen. He never wavered. Never wavered. Nothing got him from focusing on God and focusing on that promise. Nothing got him away from that. He didn't waver, y'all. He didn't waver, y'all. We got to believe God, man. Oh, my God, we got to believe God. God ain't no liar. The devil is a liar. God is not a liar. Everything God ever told me he was going to do for me, he did. He did it. Everything, he did everything he said he was going to do for me. I left here and it hurt me because he told me to. And he made a way. He did some stuff. I still don't know how I moved down there. He did so much, man. We was living in this house through American homes for rent. Y'all stay away from them. Stay away from them. We was living in this house, and this house had issues. It was termites in that house. My mama was there. Serena mama was there. It was termites in this house. All types of issues. One of the garages wouldn't open. But when we went down there and we put our money down on the house, 
before we moved in, I had all of these emails God had me sending. Why? I didn't know. Trying to get stuff fixed. So we ended up going to this subdivision and all of the houses were sold. Y'all know how the housing market is. So we went to this subdivision and the lady was like, it's nothing available right now. Somebody say, but God. but God. It was this doctor that had this house built, and we went in there and looked at the house like twice, but it was sold. This doctor. And so he didn't get whatever benefit package that he wanted from this hospital. He was coming to closer where this house was. He walked away from this house and left his $10,000 earnest money, and he put $70,000 worth of upgrades in this house. The lady in the office is a Christian. I kid you not. She said she was sitting there one day, and God told her to call the Evans. Out of everybody she had on that waiting list, God told her to call us. And we got that house. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Man, we can't doubt God. God is not no liar. If he tell you to do something, just do it. Just do it. And just believe he's going to do what he said he's going to do. We both got jobs before we left. We stayed at O'Hare Airport April 1st, the first time when we went down there to look around. And Sarita had an interview at this school. And I had prayed and asked the Lord, I already had my job. And I said, God, I know you told us to go down here. And I believe you got us going down here for a reason. And I'm being obedient to you. I ain't out here living crazy. I ain't got no girlfriend on the side. I ain't smoking. I ain't drinking. I ain't doing none of this crazy stuff, God. None of it. That's what I told him. I said, God, please. Let both of us have a job before we go down here to even look around the first time. She had an interview in the hotel in this little room that morning before we got on the airport. That principal hired her in the interview. <laughs> it's hard, but it really ain't that hard. You know what I mean? If you get to know them, if you get to know them, if you build a relationship with them, if you get to know them, Oh, my God, thank you, Father. If you get to know him, that's the key. If you get to know him, we end up with some bad relationships sometimes because we don't get to know him. But if we get to know him, then we'll know what he can do. Uh, whew, thank you, God. So he never wavered at God's promise. He didn't waver. As time went on, y'all, and it hadn't happened yet, his faith grew stronger. So that means at 75, he believed God more. At 86, 11 years later, he believed God more. At 99, he believed God more. He kept increasing his belief in God. He believed him more and more and more. When everything was hopeless, that's what the, the part that gets me in this story. When everything was hopeless, hopeless, he believed anyway. And God did exactly what he promised. And for somebody today, he's going to do exactly what he promised. So I guarantee y'all, I can guarantee you, they there, Abraham looked at what God had already done. He remembered how God told him to leave his father's house, and he was going to bring them to his place where he wanted them to go. He remembered that. I'm pretty sure through all of these years, he remembered that. He, God brought him to a place just like he said he would. Abraham knew that it didn't matter which area that he took, Bishop, because God going to be with him. God going to bless whatever land he picked, so he didn't care. He didn't care what lot picked because he knew God and he knew what God could do. So he was like, if, I, if you pick the left or the right, whichever one you pick, God going to bless the other one for me. So it really don't matter. He remembered. We got to remember. We have to remember. 
He hoped against hope. When God told Abraham, because they had this awesome relationship, that he was going down to Sodom and Gomorrah, when the three men was on the scene, the Bible say that two went on headed to Sodom. God stayed there with Abraham and spent some time with him because they had a relationship. So those was two angels. I believe, of course, it represents the Trinity, but those was two angels because in chapter 19, it talks about how they arrived to Sodom. So that was his two angels. So when God told him that he was going down there to destroy everything, he remembered. He was able to have that talk with God. Are you going to destroy the, 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 the righteous with the wicked? And he took it all the way down to, what, 10? That was a relationship that he had. So it just didn't add up that God was going to do that. He remembered all of that. He remembered when Hagar had Ishmael, but that wasn't a the son of promise who his descendants would come. He remembered all of that. God had done everything that he told Abraham he would do from the beginning, and he remembered. Do y'all remember? Do y'all remember? Do you remember what he's done in the past? Do you remember what he did today? Food on your table, remember the song, clothes on your back, shoes on your feet. Everybody in here look like they're doing pretty good. Everybody look like they ate. So do y'all remember? Do y'all remember? He remembered. We got to remember. We got to keep that stuff in the forefront of our mind, what God did. So when he tell us something that just don't make no sense, like pick up and move or do this and that, you got to remember how he kept you all through the years up until this point. So if he tell you to do something, he ain't just going to leave you out there and he told you to do it. If you're living right, if you're living right, if you got a relationship with him, that's the key. So this is why I personally believe in Genesis 22 and 8, when God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, that Abraham looked back, y'all, at all that God had done for him. And he hoped against hope again. He had to. And I believe he knew that this just didn't add up. I really do. Because he knew that God wouldn't destroy the wicked with the righteous. And so Abraham believed God, had all of this hope, was living right, all of this stuff. It just didn't, it just didn't add up. Y'all know some stuff just don't add up. And I believe that he believed that God would come through for him again. I believe he reasoned within himself, believed that if God took him, he would raise him up again. So even if he had to do it, he was going to do it because he followed God. But I just believe that he, you know, felt some kind of way about it. And if God didn't, he was going to serve him anyway. But one, it didn't add up. And one of the main parts that stood out to me in this was when he said that him and the lad was going to worship and they was going to come back. Now, he didn't tell Sarah because he didn't want nothing to get in the way. You're taking my son and all of this, what's going on. So he kept that to himself between him and God. I believe when he got up there, if something happened in his worship that made God say, hey, oh, man. For one, he was going to do it, but it was something about that worship. That was the key. That's why that's in here, because that worship, worshiping God is key. He worshiped God in the natural. He worshiped God in the spirit. He worshiped God in his life. Our life has to be a life of worship. Oh, my God. So that moved God. So if y'all could put those slides up there. I'm closing now. But I want to point something else out. From the very beginning... From the very beginning, Abraham put his spiritual hope up against natural hope. We, too, have to hope against hope. We have to put our spiritual hope up against natural hope. We have to believe that God would do what he said he would do. We have to believe without the shadow of a doubt that God can do anything. Anything. I mean, really, get your mind wrapped around that. 
It's nothing that he can't do. He can do anything. Job, leave it up there. Job 42 and 2 in the New Living Translation. I'm still on the first one. Says, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. So if we know God can do anything and nobody can stop him, why are we tripping? Why are we tripping? Think about it. We must believe the second slide, please. We must believe and know that God has given us so much evidence of his power, faithfulness, and truthfulness. Oh, my God. By a simple act of his will, he created the universe and everything in it out of nothing. Out of nothing. Out of nothing. Job 26 and 7 in the New Living Translation says God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He hanged the earth on nothing. Come on, man. Now, that's deep. The earth is hanging on nothing. We know it's hanging on his word, but naturally it's hanging on nothing out there. That's how powerful he is. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Colossians 1 and 17 says he holds all things together and supplies the need of every living creature. Job 12 and 10 Job 12 and 10 says, For the life of every living thing is in his hand, and the breath of every human being. So surely, y'all see that part? Surely if the God who made heaven and earth, who gives life and breath to every creature and human being and supplies the needs for every living creature, can do all that, then he sure can make an old woman conceive and give birth to a child. If he can do all of that, see some of that stuff that we worried about him doing? Y'all need to remember these scriptures. I remember these scriptures. Oh, my God. If he could do all of that, then it ain't nothing that he can't do. Surely. So whatever you think is a big problem, Surely. Oh, my God. Can y'all put the next one up there? So we need to take a moment and examine our hearts. We need to ask ourselves, are there any obstacles of unbelief standing between me and God? Do I hold on to doubts that cause me to laugh at the Lord's promises? If we truly believe that God is who he says he is, Nothing will shake our confidence in him. Literally nothing. When God asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? Our answer will be a resounding, no, no. Nothing is too hard for God. I got another little definition of faith. Faith is a deep conviction that God's words are true. It's believing that God will do what he said. It's believing that nothing is too hard for God and that nothing is impossible for God. Our faith should be strong in God. But we got to be made whole, y'all. That's why God got this next slide up here. We got to be made whole. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 from the message version. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy with an H, living right, walking up right before him, all of that, and whole, W-H-O-L-E. Make you holy, you got to be holy, and you got to be whole. Abraham was holy, and he was whole. So God want to make us holy and whole. We need to be whole. We need the holy with the H, and we need the whole with the W. We need that. We are three-part being. A spirit, got a soul, live in a body. Whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body. He want everything holy and whole. Everything. He don't want part of it. And keep you fit for the coming of your master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. You might not be able to depend on nobody else. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. But you can depend on God. You can depend on God. If he said he's going to do it, he's going to do it. 
oh my God, regardless, if he said it, he's going to do it. So I challenge everybody in here today to hope against hope. Y'all can stand on your feet. Hope against hope. Hope against hope. Believe God, rely upon, trust, obey, all of that. Hope against hope. When it look hopeless, keep hoping. Don't start doubting. Tell the devil to shut up. I tell him, man, go somewhere. I'm not trying to hear you. That's literally what I say. Man, go somewhere. I'm not trying to hear you. Shut up. That's what we got to do. So if it's somebody in here that want to hope against hope, that really want to hope against hope, that really want to be, be made holy and whole, this your moment. You know, when Abraham was sacrificing his son Isaac, his only son, the son he loved, that was like God sacrificing his son, Jesus, for us. He gave us a way out. But we need to get to know him, y'all. We got to have a relationship with him, y'all. We can't be playing. We can't be playing. So if anybody want to change, anybody want to take it a little further, we don't need no music to worship God. I learned that. We don't need no music. Abraham didn't have no songs playing when he was worshiping God. When he was hoping against hope and believing in all of that stuff, he ain't had no five instruments and all of that stuff playing. He ain't had no drama. He ain't have no organist, no musician, all of that. It was him and God. So, Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I honor you. I adore you, God. I worship you, Lord God. You are amazing. You are awesome, Lord God. I thank you for life. I thank you for health. I thank you for strength, Lord God. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for teaching us how to hope against hope, Lord God. How to believe you when it don't look like it's no way that it's going to happen, oh God. To believe you, to rely on you, to depend on you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that everything you've ever said that you were going to do, you do it, Lord God. You always come through, Lord God. We can always count on you, Lord God. We might not be able to count on man, Lord God, but we can count on you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, help us to stay in your will, to keep our mind on you, Lord God, to stay focused on you, Lord God, to walk uprightly before you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, if there's anybody who needs to come to the altar, we telling the devil right now again, shut up, man. Ain't nobody thinking about you. If you feel God pulling on you, then you need to come on up to the altar because this is your moment. We got to love people, y'all. We can't be looking at nobody funny, y'all. We can't be looking at nobody funny, y'all. If God going to use us to help somebody, we got to show them love. No matter what they doing, no matter what they smell like, no matter what they look like, we got to show them love. 